that should be live now ali let me know if anything yeah so yeah stop, feel free to start whenever cool i'll give it a couple more minutes guys and just see if anyone else is joining and then we'll get cracking Um, I think we'll get started. People are um, trickling in, but um, we can start like with um, introductions and stuff. And then hopefully by the time we get into the swing a bit, people will have joined. Um, so um, my name's Ellie. Um, I'm an F1 doctor um, working in the West Midlands at the moment. Um, so I've just finished um, my four months on respiratory medicine and I've just rotated on to trauma and orthopaedics. Um, in a district general so care of the elderly is something I'm doing quite a lot of at the moment so hopefully I can give you like a good run through um, so um, just a little overview then of what we'll cover tonight um, so acute confusion we'll do and we'll do falls we'll do off legs in inverted commas and we'll discuss why it's inverted commas um, polypharmacy um, and then we'll do um, we'll just we can just summarize at the end um, so the way we'll do it, I, I'm sure you guys have been to these talks before, but if not, um, and mainly we'll do it with um, MCQs with one single best answer. Um, I have also got um, like an OSCE style case um, to kind of walk, walk through. Um, now, I'm not expecting you guys to like turn your cameras on and chat if you don't want to. That's completely fine. Um, but there is a chat um, optional medal. Um, so what, when we get to that bit, um, you guys can just pop suggestions in the chat. I think that would probably be the easiest way to do it. Or um, obviously, please do talk out loud if you feel like it. But I um, absolutely won't be insisting on that. Um, OK, um, so halfway through, I'll put up the QR code for feedback and I'll do it again at the end just to give you a bit of a chance to like pull it up on your phones. Um, and I'm very happy um, to be interrupted as we go through with questions. Um, so like that's fine. Don't be shy. Put them in the chat or um, unmute yourselves um, or you can save them to the end, like whatever um, you guys prefer. Um, so we'll dive in then with um, acute confusion. So um, an 87 year old lady has been admitted with a community acquired pneumonia. Overnight, she's become extremely agitated and is having visual hallucinations. She has not slept and is no longer oriented to time or place. Her past medical history is hypertension, chronic kidney disease stage two and arthritis. Her only regular meds are amlodipine and paracetamol, which is or what is the most likely cause of her presentation so i'll let you just digest um the options um, um so i've not tried this before but i'm going to try and put it as a poll in the chat um let's see if it works if it doesn't then we'll just go back to the um normal So I've popped the poll up. Um, now, we don't know, we haven't tested this, if you can see each other's um, answers, like how many people are answering, but just have a go um, and see what you guys think. So I'll give you a few minutes to just um, digest. Thank you. 
Yeah, so I can see that most of you guys are answering B, which is correct. So it's most likely to be caused by um, delirium. So um, just before I explain um, why that's the answer, um, this is quite a common way for um, a finals question to be phrased. So what is the most likely or um, another one is like, what should you do first if we're talking about management? So I've just popped it in there just to get you guys familiar with the style. So because actually like it could it could be um, more than one of these, but what the most likely thing is, is delirium. Um, so we'll talk about delirium in more detail on the next slide, but just um, to kind of go through why it's not a few of the others. Um, so a stroke, um, if it was a stroke, you would be expecting um, probably more of a motor or sensory deficit, and you'd expect it to be normally unilateral. And um, so this is not a typical presentation. Um, in terms of the medication induced psychosis, so she's only taking amlodipine and paracetamol, um, neither of which are really associated with psychosis. And we, the question stem hasn't mentioned any new um, medication. Um, so unlikely. And then schizophrenia and Charles Bonnet syndrome, um, it would be extremely unlikely for an 87 year old to have a first presentation of either of these, um, you know, they she would have had this before and we would have then mentioned it in the past medical history so yeah the answer is b delirium so just to define delirium then um it's an abrupt decline in cognitive function um and it follows a fluctuating course and this is really important um and by fluctuating it can fluctuate within a day it can fluctuate within a few days even a couple of hours um and it that is quite important that it will go up and down. So um, the symptoms of delirium. Um, so everything is altered. That's kind of the theme, altered something. So altered perception, um, it's very common um, to have delusions or misperceptions. So for example, that they're being held against their will um, or that they're somewhere that they're not um, and hallucinations. Um, quite distressing can be visual or auditory visual is more common altered cognitive function so that would be like a new confusion which is what our lady in the stem had um, she was no longer oriented to time or place um, inattention so what we mean by that is probably won't be able to have a proper conversation with you probably won't be able to answer questions or focus on the radio or the telly like they would normally do um, altered social behaviour, um, so they might be shouting, they might be disinhibited, um, they might be pacing. Um, altered level of consciousness, so um, really, really common, and one of the first things that you'll pick up is a sleep cycle disturbance. Um, so very often people um, who are suffering from delirium are awake at night and sleep in the day, and that is really common. Um, but they also might be really lethargic, um, it can go either way. And then altered physical function. Um, so you can have hyperactive or hypoactive delirium. Um, so generally hyperactive is usually easier to spot and diagnose because it follows kind of what you classically think of as delirium. So very agitated, shouting, pacing, having all these delusions um, or hallucinations. Um, you will see a very active but distressed person hypoactive um is sometimes more subtle so um someone can really like look like they've really shut down just sleep all the time refuse oral intake um it can be quite commonly confused with either a stroke or depression actually um so they just really you know aren't engaging at all um, you won't see the pacing or the um you know the agitation so it's important to remember that there's those two types, but also you can get a mixed picture just to make it easy for you. Um, so you might well see um, symptoms of both within delirium. So causes of delirium. Um, so a way I like to think about this is I had um, an elderly care consultant um, on um, an on-call and he always says, um, you know, Ellie, these patients, delirious patients, they're just crying out for the you they're saying pinch me pinch me and I was like what does he mean but he means this um mnemonic and I find it really really helpful when I'm thinking about um what 
are the key causes of delirium. And this is not an exhaustive list. And I'm going to say this quite a lot of times in this presentation. Um, I can't, you know, you wouldn't want me to list everything exhaustively. So we're just going to co cover the really important ones. So pinch me is our mnemonic then to think about causes. Um, so pain um, is really common, um, especially on a, in a patient with a background of dementia um, who um, may not perceive or indeed communicate pain um, like you or I might. Um, but um, for example, um, you might get somebody who fell down some stairs, has got lots of rib fractures, that's extremely painful. Um, and they may later go on to develop delirium if we don't um, adequately control their pain. Infection is what everyone thinks of, I think, when they think of delirium. So the classic is a urinary tract infection, um, but it can be any infection. So it's important not to just go straight for the UTI and um, think about chest. Um, think about um, cellulitis, you know, there's lots of other causes of infection. Uh, nutrition, so especially if someone's coming into hospital with a new delirium, um, are they getting adequate nutrition um, wherever they're living? And um, poor nutrition um, is a big cause. Constipation, um, this is a very, very common cause. Um, and, you know, when um, you you guys like start working you'll see it all the time um it's really common especially if someone's less mobile than usual to become quite constipated and that can lead to delirium hydration um so if someone's not adequately hydrated um medications there's lots of different medications um that can contribute um new antibiotics is quite common but there's lots um you know kind of the list is endless in terms of medications so when you're thinking about is it a medication it's useful to look at if anything new has been started and then environment is one that's really common and really important that we probably don't think about enough um so this is specifically um for you know kind of patients that are in hospital and then go on to develop delirium you know if they're in a bay with lots of loud um other bay mates and things are really noisy um that can be enough um to to trigger a, an episode of delirium so those are the causes on the left um there are some risk factors as well which are important to be aware of so someone's more likely um, to experience delirium if they've had it before, um, which makes sense. If they're over 65, um, if they have dementia, if they have poor mobility, um, and that's partly because it can then go on to lead to some of the causes. So if someone's not very mobile, um, their nutrition may be poor because they can't physically go and get their food. Um, they might be constipated. Um, if you're not moving around much, things don't move as, as much. They might not be hydrated. Again, they might they can't go and get water or whatever they'd like to drink. Um, and somebody with severe comorbidities um, is also at much higher risk. OK, so investigation and management of delirium. Basically, the, the mainstay of it is you've got to work out why. So that's through your history and your examination. Um, and then you would investigate based on what you think might be going on. Um, and so, you know, you would do an infection screen, so a chest X-ray, send off a urine culture, um, maybe a sputum culture. So you, you would do a really thorough kind of top to toe history and exam. And the only way to definitively manage delirium is to treat the underlying cause. But while we're kind of working on that, there are some supportive um, things we can do to help manage delirium. So ideally, um, try and keep the same um, doctors, nursing team, um, allied health professional kind of wider team that's looking after the patient. Try and keep them the same if possible and just gently reorientate somebody. So we, we generally um, encourage not to just, you know, if someone insists that, you know, um, they're in prison um you know it's not helpful to kind of really really argue with them just gently bring them back to where they are environmental adaptation so in the um care of the elderly ward in my trust there's a massive clock in each bay um we encourage people to have um, their own like familiar things from home encourage visiting family 
and then medication. So it's really important to avoid unnecessary medication. We're going to touch on this more when we discuss polypharmacy. Um, but it's also worth mentioning as well, just um, sedating medications are not helpful. Um, they often make delirium worse in the long term. And we only really advocate the use of them if um, someone's at risk to themselves or others. So, um, yeah, just to just to be aware that kind of like benzodiazepines or like haloperidol generally um, isn't they're not really very useful. OK, so we're going to go on to an OSCE case study now. Um, so for this, it, if you guys are um, able to kind of get involved, just pop things in the chat. Um, that would be great because it just makes it a little bit more um, interactive. So this is the bit. So if you're doing an OSCE and you're stood outside the station, this is what's on the wall for you to read. So you're an FY1 working in the emergency department. An 80 year old male has presented following an unwitnessed fall and you are asked to take a history and perform an examination. So what key questions are, you, are going through your head when you're thinking about what you need to ask in this history? So I'll let you guys um, have a little think. But yeah, um, any suggestions? Nothing is a silly suggestion at all. Yeah, great. So yeah, absolutely. Before, during and after is the mainstay of a fool's history that's great yeah loss of consciousness absolutely and um, we'll talk more about that but that's really really important yeah injuries perfect yeah so you guys are thinking exactly the wrong along the right lines here um yeah, great. So those are some specific symptoms. I'll just read out um, these in case anyone can't see the chat. So um, incontinence, tongue biting or seizure like activity. So absolutely. Um, they are specific things that we should be asking about. So um, here we go. So um, quite right then. So we want to think about before, during, after and then now. So before um I always ask this, a good way of doing it is, what were you doing when you fell? Um, you know, were they gardening? Were they trying to stand up? What were they doing? And do they remember it? Because um, that's really important. Because if they don't remember it, that's quite concerning. If they do remember it, then that's a really valuable source of information. And did they have any preceding symptoms? Um, so things we would be thinking about are like palpitations. Did they have chest pain? Did they have a sudden headache? Um, did they feel um, like syn pre-syncopal? Um, did they lose consciousness? Then we want to think about the during. So we're thinking how they felt, which you guys quite rightly said in the in the chat. Did they injure themselves? Um, so. A way of asking that as well is like, how did you land? Did you land on an outstretched hand? Um, did they fall backwards? Um, and that can then help indicate, did they lose consciousness? Which is the next question, because sometimes people aren't sure, but the way they fell can give us quite a lot of clues. Um, and this is helpful as well if you've got someone there for a collateral history, you can bring them together. So if someone went down like a sack of potatoes, that indicates like a loss of consciousness and potentially syncope. If someone went stiff as a board and then fell, um, we might be thinking about a seizure. Um, if someone went onto an outstretched hand, are we thinking about a mechanical fall? So it's really important to think about exactly how it happened. And then afterwards, um, you want to think, um, so how did they get up? Did they do it? Could they get themselves up? If not, did they need help? Um, and how much, how long they were on the floor. Um, does anyone know why we care about that? You can just pop it in the chat if you know. Why do we care about the length of time on the floor? Mm 
yeah perfect and um, rhabdomyolysis yeah um so that would be um rhabdomyolysis caused by um breakdown of muscles um and we care about that um because that can cause a really dreadful um acute kidney injury and um, which can make someone kind of life threateningly unwell um did they have any symptoms following the fall so we're thinking pain but also as someone quite rightly said in the um, chat, if we're thinking about seizures, were they post-ictal, were they confused? Um, did they still have chest pain? That's really important. And then how do they feel now? Um, so are there any lasting symptoms? Are they still confused? Are we worried about concussion? Um, but also that's kind of when I um, would kind of start to think about any preceding illness. So how are you feeling now? Do you have a cough? Um, how long have you had that? Is this actually like an infective cause? And that's when I would always um, just do a very quick systems review. Um, you know, you might have been given something in the history that you want to tap into a system in more detail. But if up to this point you haven't really, that would be your, your chance to do it. Um, past medical history then. So there's some um, conditions that are particularly relevant that I would always think about asking um, by name as well as just saying like, do you take any regular um, meds for anything? Have you been in hospital? So any cognitive impairment, um, any cardiovascular conditions. So um, do they have heart failure? Do they have an arrhythmia that we know about? Um, Parkinson's disease. Um, so that, that kind of come, there's a two reasons why we might, we always want to know about that is the first is the orthostatic hypertension that comes with it. And that's because in Parkinson's, you have an autonomic dysfunction. But also, um, generally, people with Parkinson's have a very classic gait. You've probably heard of it, the shuffling gait. So they take very small steps and they tend to tip forward as they walk. And it's really common for them to then tip all the way to the floor. So Parkinson's is very um, high risk. Um, for falls and then sensory impairment so that again that's got lots of um, factors so we're thinking um, you know visually can they see where they're going was this mechanical because they didn't see um, an obstacle um, have they got a hearing or vestibular problems have they actually got vertigo and um, that's why they fell um, under sensory we can also think about peripheral neuropathies so actually have they got um, really terrible um, peripheral neuropathy and they just can't feel the floor with their feet. Um, so these are things that I would be thinking about asking specifically. And then drug history. Um, so it's great to ask this. Um, again, there's a couple that I would ask if I remembered. Um, so anything sedating. So do they take any benzos? So do they take diazepam for a bad back um, or anxiety? Diuretics? Um, are really common they can kind of cause you to um, drop your blood pressure um so are they on frusamide um antidepressants um they can cause um an orthostatic hypertension as can anticholinergics and then steroids um so steroids um they are less commonly cause um a postural hypertension but they really do cause muscle weakness especially long-term use so they're another one to be aware of and actually like certainly um on my acute medicine shifts i've seen quite a few falls secondary to long-term steroid use so a good one to be aware of so this is um perhaps not the kindest mnemonic but it is really helpful um if you're you know in an oski or if you do long cases at your med school and you think oh my goodness cannot think what to what to ask splattered is quite a helpful mnemonic um i had to use it in my finals when i panicked um so worth bearing in mind so it's all the stuff we've already talked about but it just uses it to help so um symptoms any previous falls that's always really useful um because actually um, we know that people that have had falls before are far more likely to fall again Location, so where, we've talked about that, we've talked about activity, any trauma sustained, so um, that's quite a nice way to remind you to check, and time, um, you know, was this immediately after taking tablets, and is it the tablet that's the um, culprit, is it food, is it um, postprandial hypertension, um, were they getting up, 
um, and then the drug history. So that's just a um, useful prompt. Um, you know, if all else fails and your mind goes blank, it is quite useful. Um, and then just thinking about investigations. So I went too fast. Um, do you guys want to pop any investigations that you would think about doing for someone that's fallen in the chat? I know I have showed you a quick glance, but um, just pop a few in the chat. Let's see, we can go through them. You guys are less keen on this one. Um, so we'll just go ahead and talk through it. So I don't know how you guys have been taught to structure your investigations. So if we go, we you know, this is still an OSCE station. Um, you've had, you know, five to seven minutes to date your history. And the examiner may stop you and ask you a couple of questions. Investigations is a really common um, thing that they probably will want to talk about. So I was always taught um, to structure my investigations like this, and I've um, continued to do it like through med school and now working, and I find it really helpful. So you've got bedside, bloods, slash laboratory tests, imaging and specials. And I always kind of divide up my investigations this way. I find it very useful and it kind of shows as well, um, you know, if you use this, it shows an examiner that you are thinking it through. You're not just kind of like spouting random things so bedside and um, vital signs you can always do vital signs lying and standing blood pressure in a fall that is essential you need to know if there's a postural drop blood glucose um so are they hypoglycemic um, is that why they fell and an ecg so you want to think about arrhythmias there and um, you wouldn't do a urine dipstick and um, but you can send a urinary culture to just a spot question. Does anyone know why we won't do this in care of the elderly? No. Gosh, I hope I'm not putting you all to sleep. Um, so the reason we don't do a urine dipstick is because pretty much... Um, most people over the age of 65 have an asymptomatic um, bacteria in their urine. So it will light up saying there's nitrites and leukocytes, um, but we don't need to treat that unless it's causing them symptoms. So in people over the age of 65, you treat UTIs based on clinical signs and you would send for culture um, to guide your antibiotics, but you never do a dipstick unless you're looking for something else. So if you're looking for blood, protein, you can, but if it's for a UTI, then you don't. Um, bloods then, so you think about your FBC, CRP, so you think about infection, use and ease, um, have they got, um, have they been on the floor for quite a long time? Have they got an AKI? Um, have they got a metabolic abnormality? That's why they fell. Plotting, um, so particularly thinking about injuries, especially if they're on blood thinners, um, vitamin B12 and folate. So um, this is always really useful if they're, especially if they're then also confused, but also, um, you know, if they are deficient, they could have neuropathies, muscle weakness, thyroid, and um, that comes in under the confusion screen. Um, but again, also, you know, um, it could make someone more prone to falling and cultures if you think there's an infection. Imaging, um, so chest x-ray, um, very useful if you're looking for an infection, um, but also um, if you're concerned over like a new breathlessness um, or if you think it's heart failure. Any bony injuries, you would do an x-ray at least. Um, it's always worth thinking that if if the x-ray is clear, but there's clearly, you know, there's swelling, um, there's, a, there's a clear injury, you can then do a CT. Um, and a CT head. So there's lots of guidelines about when to do a CT head and in what time frame. So things that would earn you a CT head in an hour um, would be um, reduced GCS, um, 
any signs of um bleeding and you're you're on a blood thinner um so any signs of like a basal skull fracture things that would earn you um a ct head in eight hours so an unwitnessed fall on blood thinners that would um head injury and then subsequent vomiting so there's um i won't go through the whole list but there are some really good guidelines on on nice about who gets a ct and when and then special tests so if you think that somebody might have heart failure and echo is really useful and um, if you think it was an arrhythmia you could do 24 hour halter um you know anything you can think of i always think in these you know that obviously this isn't like a list that you have to follow if you can justify your investigation that's fine the examiner's happy it's much better to come up with something a bit weird but justify it then just reel off a list and then not and not really say why you're doing it because the examiner will always want to think see that you're thinking um so yeah you could come up with literally anything as long as you can justify it then you can have it Okay, so then just thinking about causes of falls. So most falls are multifactorial. It's unusual for a fall to be just one thing, just one pure thing that's caused a fall. Um, so that's worth bearing in mind. But the way we look at kind of causes of falls is intrinsic. Um, so some essentially like a condition for that person. Um, and then extrinsic, which is anything going on around them. So... Um, things that we think about intrinsic, so syncope, um, dizziness, vertigo we mentioned, um, seizures, someone mentioned in the chat is very, um, very important, um, peripheral neuropathies, um, we've mentioned, um, autonomic dysfunction, so um, that could be Parkinson's disease, um, but you, there is also other things that are slightly less common, so postural or with the static tachycardia syndrome so POTS that counts as autonomic dysfunction um cognitive impairment um side effects of drugs or alcohol um and it's important to just you know um people that are old can still um use recreational drugs or um, be alcohol dependent so certainly like just because someone's a little bit older still think about that and then age-related frailty um extrinsic factors then so um poor these are the things that in their environment so poor lighting clutter um pets and children getting onto their feet um have they recently moved to their environment now really unfamiliar um do they not have the right mobility aid or any um so those are the other things that you would start to think about as well so this is just like um this is the QR code. I'll just give you a chance to um, use it if you guys want to, because um, I know like at the end it can be a bit of a rush. So if you um, just pop that up there for you and um, we'll talk a bit more about the feedback at the end. But um, just that's just like it's just there for you if you want it. Um, but we'll probably move on in the interest of time and um, fairly quickly. Um, just while we're at this point, um, any questions so far? Or are you guys happy? I'm going to um, take that as happy. Um, so we'll move on. I'm just create, setting the next poll in motion. So we're um, back with another um, MCQ. So I've popped the poll in and here is the question. So a 76 year old female presents to the emergency department with a two day history of being off legs following five days of diarrhea. She's usually mobile with a frame. She reports lethargy, muscle weakness and feels really dizzy when she stands up. On examination, she looks clinically dehydrated and has hyporeflexia so her reflexes are not as good as they should be which abnormality in her blood tests is the most likely cause for her symptoms so hypokalemia hyperglycemia hyponatremia hypernitremia or hypercalcemia sorry they're quite difficult to say all in a row so i'll let you guys um start voting okay. 
I'll just give you a few more minutes. Okay, so I think responses are slowing down now. So um, the answer is C, hyponatremia. Um, so low sodium um, can cause um, really terrible lethargy, um, muscle weakness, um, postural hypotension, which is what she's describing, um, feeling dizzy when she stands up. Um, it's the only electrolyte abnormality that causes a true hyporeflexia. So that's your big um, indicator in the history. Um, it also, um, the other clue was the clinic, the diarrhea, and then she looked clinically dehydrated. So this is a case of hypovolemic hyponatremia. Um, other, the other options, you know, are sensible. So hypokalemia, that is certainly like a, a sensible one to think about because especially with this history of diarrhea. Um, but generally you would just get a little bit of muscle pain, a bit of abdominal pain. Um, it's actually quite unusual for someone to get symptomatic hypokalemia. It's normally picked up on a blood test, like a routine one run by the GP. Um, it's unlikely um, to be this bad. And um, you don't get a proper hyporeflexia either um, in the same way that you do with hyponatremia. Hyperglycemia. Um, so if in the history there'd been a comment about type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes um, or impaired glucose tolerance, then you might go, oh, is it is it hyperglycemia? But you would expect to hear about um, polydipsia and polyuria. Um, at least one of them, really, um, in a question stem to make you think about that. We've talked about why it's hyponatremia. Hypernatremia, um, certainly one to think about because um, you can get hypernatremic when you've lost lots of water or lost lots of salt. So the diarrhea history um, kind of fits with that. Um, but generally, um, you would you would get um, like myoclonic jerks or you, you would feel really lethargic um, and you can you can get seizures. Actually, that's worth saying with both hypo and hypernatremia in, you know, severe, severe cases, kind of the worst case scenario are seizures and then a coma. And that's why, um, you know, we do treat it as a medical emergency when it's really severe. Um, but yeah, in hypernatremia, you'd be thinking about things like myoclonic jerks. And then hypercalcemia um, is your classic bone stones, groans and psychic bones. Um, so um, pain in your bones, um, you think about like kidney stones, abdominal pain, depression. That's none of this is really mentioned in the in the stem. So let's talk about off legs. What do we mean by off legs? So off legs can really mean two things. So it's really important to clarify what we mean. So for example, you know, you're working on the medical take and you get the referral from the ED and it's a fifth, you know, 85 year old female off legs. And that's your referral. And you're thinking, oh, God, what does this mean? So either off legs means difficulty walking or more commonly, it means an acute deterioration in mobility. And that's normally what people mean. So key causes of acute deteriorations in mobility are very similar to delirium. So it's always good if you're struggling to think about um, the two together. Um, and it might prompt you to think of what um, some of the causes. So infection is always a culprit. So chest or urine are the two most common, but any infection um, can cause it. Dehydration, neurological, so a head injury, or if they got a new cord or equina or a cord of compression. Um, orthopedics, um, so fractures. So it's really important to remember um, in the elderly that they could have a much lower velocity um, injury and lead to quite a nasty injury. So, um, you know, for example, you know, you've heard about an 85 year old who's only fallen on a carpeted floor from standing and yet she's got a neck femur fracture. 
um, just remember that the elderly can be really osteoporotic um, and, and prone to nasty injuries. Metabolic abnormalities, so that's what we've kind of just gone through um, on the slide before. Um, and then alcohol, um, drug or medication. So we've discussed this um, and polypharmacy we'll talk about. And then hypoxia, um, have they got a new pneumonia? Um, have they got decompensated heart failure? Um, do they have COPD? There's lots of reasons why they might be hypoxic and that would stop you from being as mobile as usual and it would be acute. Okay, difficulty walking. Um, so I'm just going to use this as an opportunity to discuss surgical sieve. So you guys probably um, have seen this before, or you might have a different one that you use. And I, um, if you do use a different one, I'd love you to put it in the chat because, um, you know, like I use this at work every day. Um, I always love to hear about new ones and it might help other people as well. Um, if you don't like this one, you might be able to suggest it different one so I'd really love it if you do have a different one just pop it in the chat so surgical sieve is a little bit misleading because it doesn't have to be a surgical presentation um, and it's basically a way of generating differentials for a condition so we're going to do it with difficulty walking today um, but it could be um, chest pain it could be breathlessness or a headache abdominal pain it's really useful um, for any kind of presenting complaint and this is when I would be thinking about using it in an OSCE, um, you know, when you get your little thing on the outside and it probably give you a headline. Um, you can use this to start generating your differentials that you're then going to rule in or out with your history. Um, so vascular, um, infective, traumatic, autoimmune, metabolic, iatrogenic, so that's what we do, um, and then idiopathic neoplastic and degenerative so specifically to difficulty walking um vascular i like to break up into cardiac and neurological or brain um so arrhythmias hypertension have they had a stroke infective and inflammatory so arthritis um and that can be in any joint myopathies um you can also get like slightly less common um infections like a discitis or a very common one like a cellulitis traumatic so we've discussed um how the elderly are more at risk of nasty fractures but also soft tissue injuries as well autoimmune so we could be thinking about ms um that is definitely a reason why someone might have trouble walking um, metabolic we've already covered really um, iatrogenic then so we're thinking about like toxins and drugs and that might be the, what, those that we give or um, that they consume recreationally and then loss of, con lo loss of confidence as well so if they've had a previous fall um, they might just really be scared to try and mobilize and that will mean they technically have difficulty walking neoplastic um you know the older someone the longer someone's been alive technically the more likely they are to then go on to develop a cancer you know we know that cancers develop um through mutations and when cells like uh, replicate and lose kind of their um fail safe mechanisms so it you know the older someone gets the more likely they are to develop a cancer so it is worth thinking about um is this what's going on and um brain metastases i think especially in the elderly population are far more common than like a brain primary so thinking about is there a chance that that's what's going on and then degenerative so um you know things like motor neuron disease dementias they can affect the ability to walk parkinson's um all of those kind of come under that umbrella okay so got another question i think Okay, so question three. Um, so let me just pop that poll up for you guys and then I'll read it out as well. Okay, so um, a 70 year old male presents to his GP with a three month history of bilateral and swollen ankles. They're not painful, red or warm. He has a past medical history of hypertension, type 2 diabetes and COPD. 
he says his friend recently was prescribed water tablets to help with leg swelling and he would like to try them. Which one of the following drugs is most likely to be causing his symptoms? So I'll let you guys... You guys are on it with this one. You're all um, all agreeing with each other um, and all getting it right. Um, so, yeah, it is amlodipine. Um, it's a really classic um, finals question as well. High yield in prescribing safety. Um, so it's amlodipine. Um, that is the classic um, most talked about side effect of amlodipine is um, peripheral edema or leg swelling. Um, the other drugs, you wouldn't really see that. So with Lestartan and Bisoprolol, you're more likely to see um, like postural hypertension. Metformin, um, the classic is um, lactic acidosis, but I have to say it happens a lot less than a textbook would lead you to believe. But for an exam, that is what you need to remember. And salbutamol inhaler, so you'd be looking at like tachycardia, um, tremor, anxiety, that kind of thing. Okay, so I've got another question as well, because we lost a question on the um, OSCE case, so I've added an extra question. So, let me set this one up. There we go. So a 72-year-old man presents to his GP after several falls at home. He reports feeling dizzy after he stands up. He experiences no chest pain, palpitations or shortness of breath. His past medical history is hypertension, high cholesterol, ischemic heart disease, atrial fibrillation and benign prostatic hyperplasia. Which one of the following drugs is most likely to be interacting with Ramipril? to cause his symptoms. So we've got tamsulosin, atorvastatin, paracetamol, aspirin, and apixaban. I'll let you guys have a minute. Yeah, so you guys are on the ball again with this one. So yeah, it is tamsulosin. Um, so this is an alpha blocker. Um, so it is also um, essentially, a va it will cause vasodilation um, as Ramapril will, albeit by a different mechanism. Um, so both of those coming together means he's far more likely to experience um, postural hypotension, which is what he's describing, um, feeling dizzy after he stands up. So yeah, um, excellent job with those two so polypharmacy then um like in my research for this talk um there wasn't really a consensus of whether it's four or five or more medications in one patient um for my finals i learned four but um that you know other um kind of journals will say five um so there's if you have someone with polypharmacy, there's a much higher risk of drugs interacting with each other. If there's more of them, that makes sense. And there's also a higher risk of adverse drug reactions. So especially in the elderly, um, and we're going to talk about why in the elderly. Um, and there's also a risk of a prescribing cascade. So um, an example would be our gentleman in the um, case, the question that was taking on Lodipine, then got ankle swelling, um, you know, he could have then been prescribed furosemide um, to help with the swelling, um, which could have then led to him having like a low potassium, so he needs Sandoke. Um, that would be a cascade. So um, getting a side effect from a drug, prescribing another drug for that side effect, and so on and so on. And we really try and avoid that. Um, so just a word then on pharmacokinetics in the elderly and why we mind so much about polypharmacy. So, um, you know, the four key um, parts of pharmacokinetics are there. So absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion. So um, older people don't produce as much stomach acid and they also don't clear it as quickly. Um, so 
not only is their kind of digestion poor, but also their gastric emptying is quite slow and they will have a delay in colonic transit. So you can essentially think of it as like a bit of reduced bioavailability. Distribution. So older people have a higher fat to water ratio. Um, so there's a smaller volume of distribution as you get older, um, which means like a the same dose um, would have a higher concentration once in the body in someone that's older. Um, and so we worry about that as well. Um, metabolism. So thyroid function, just as you get older, it just gets slower, the thyroid. Um, you know, you'll see loads of people that are quite old on levothyroxine just because as they get older, their thyroid isn't as good. Um, blood flow to the liver um, is slower and decreased and the liver itself gets smaller so metabolism is going to be slower because the capacity to do so is less so then you think about how quickly can these um, drugs that you're giving be metabolized and do you need to dose adjust and excretion so um you know much like the thyroid um generally the kidneys get a little bit less good as you get older and you're going to see loads of people with chronic kidney disease so if you've got poor renal function, um, you're going to just take longer to get rid of any drugs that are renally excreted. And a really good example of this is opiates. Um, so you need to really change your dose of opiates because actually if someone can't get rid of it as quickly as they should, they could end up um, having, you know, like a respiratory depression from essentially an overdose because their body just can't get rid of it so it's hanging around um so that's just a quick um just slide about why we care so much about um polypharmacy um in the elderly so um hopefully on time yeah we're doing quite well for time so that's um everything that i wanted to cover this evening um we've still got like seven five seven minutes um for questions so um very happy if you want to put them in the chat any questions about what we've covered this evening but also like more general questions about like finals f1 um very happy to take anything it doesn't have to be specific to care of the elderly um i've put the qr code back up um so medal just automatically generates your certificate of attendance once you've done the feedback form and i'm very grateful for them because i need it for my portfolio so thank you very much. Um, the next talk is on the 11th. I think that's Monday. Um, and that's about urology um, for those of you that are joining. Um, and if you have any questions that you think of later, which is quite common, um, there's just an email address there um, for any later questions. But we'll, I'll just hang on till eight. Um, so if you guys um, do want to type any questions in the chat, I'm very happy to answer them. And yeah, I hope this was useful and um, interesting, as interesting as it can be. Okay, um, so thank you all for coming and hope you enjoyed. <laughs>